Welcome. Is there a right and wrong approach to doing ministry in the local community? Noel Castellanos is the CEO of the Christian Community Development Organization, and he says yes, in fact, there is a right and wrong way. Some of the things that we do in the name of ministry are actually harmful to people. Welcome, Noel. Thank you very much. Great to be here yeah. today. Well, we're glad to have you. And tell us, is, is that true? I mean, can that act, there actually be a right and wrong way to do ministry? Well, when you uh, say that out loud, it seems almost uh, impossible that that could be true. What could be bad about helping somebody? But uh, one of the things that we have found, um, as uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years in, in neighborhoods all over the country, is uh, that uh, oftentimes people in the community that we have been trying to help uh, actually get dependent on our assistance and our relief work. Right. And instead of them actually taking control of their life or beginning to uh, see signs of uh, actually moving forward, they, they become dependent. And uh, I think a, a very good example of how we have seen that happen uh, mm -hmm. in our country is uh, welfare. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. So uh, here's a great idea, a program that says uh, whenever there's poverty, we've got to help people get out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And you begin to provide uh, assistance, whether it's money or food or whatever and it disincentivizes people from actually working. Right. And uh, I do believe that one of the great uh, uh, wisdom verses in the Bible is, you know, we've got to work, so, uh, or we got to work so that we might eat. eat right. right. Yeah, sure. so, so yeah, I think there are ways that we can actually hurt people by uh, trying to help them. Right. Yeah, I, I think that as we at, at St. Clement's Church and, and other churches here in El Paso have evaluated our own ministries, We've looked at some of the things that yeah. we've done and some of uh, the concepts that you're talking about. We definitely have seen that in action yes. uh, where, where we were creating a dependency, disempowering the father and the family or whatever by yeah. giving Christmas presents and yes. stuff. So right. I, know, I know that's been our experience, but um, what can be so wrong with um, you know, doing a one-shot deal where yeah. uh, you're you're giving out food or the you know food pantry or yeah. what yeah. kind of thing like that. I think that's the classic example. You've probably uh, mm -hmm. mentioned a couple uh, mm -hmm. already. Uh, the Christmas giveaway, mm -hmm. where uh, usually mothers and the kids come, they pick up a free gift, and the fathers are nowhere to be seen because right. they feel really embarrassed about that. Uh, food, you know, where. Um, um, again, many of our government programs, the way they're set up is if you get food from the government, you have to give it away for free. And so uh, I was in a uh, beautiful uh, food pantry uh, facility not too long ago, and uh, the director said, uh, uh, so we've been serving some of our families for over 15, 20 years. With great pride. Same families, <laughs> yeah, right? right. And, and I could barely keep myself from saying now, are you saying that's a good thing? Yeah, right. right. Uh, but so, so what is it about uh, that that, uh, you know, uh, makes us continue to do it? I think one of the really important things that we have to talk about is, is it, is, is helping and, and, and giving, is it, is it more for us mm -hmm. or is it for the people we're trying to help? Right. Right. What's the focus? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, if uh, we take one of the very simple verses of the Bible, we're to love others as we want to be loved ourselves, mm -hmm. I mean, none of us want to be paternalized. Mm -hmm. None of us want to be looked down upon, treated as a charity case, or mm -hmm. you know, looked upon as somebody that doesn't have any ability to do uh, for ourselves or for our families. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we were to practice that principle and say, okay, when I think about trying to uh, come alongside somebody who's really suffering and hurting, uh, what's the best way to do that? Mm -hmm. And Obviously, there are emergency situations, relief situations where, uh, where it's uh, you know the beginning of Katrina sure. or it's it's a fire or something where the immediate thing is let's provide relief, but very quickly uh, our relief can turn into something that's very harmful. Right. Now, if you you look at this and you look at the structure of so many programs, right. um, you know, welfare, for example, or food stamps, or 
you know, medical care, that all of that kind of thing, would you say that, that we are inadvertently creating a dependency situation? And what do you do about such yeah. a massive system? Yeah, um, I think the first thing we do is that we, we uh, kind of evaluate what is it we are trying to accomplish. And I think if we get down to the basic root, is that we're trying to empower people, right? right? We're trying to help them get on their feet so that they can, I mean, like uh, our founder is a guy by the name of John Perkins, and he loves to say the best uh, social program you can create is to give somebody a job, right. okay? Sure. So so that and that's a, a sustainable approach. It's something that, uh, you know, you're not giving them anything. They're earning their way and being able to take care of their family. But I think if we were to begin to evaluate uh, the end purpose of our programs, uh, whatever that is, and say, is it really accomplishing the end that we want to accomplish, which is helping people to get out of poverty? Or is it, is there other things that it's accomplishing? Giving us a place to serve, mm -hmm. providing a place for us to feel good about ourselves as the primary thing. Now, all of those side benefits, I think, are really uh, natural and good. But if, it, uh, if we do it at the expense of really saying, okay, this family, we've been tracking with them for eight months or a year. Uh, do they have their own apartment? Are we helping them to get a job? Are, are they getting training? Are their kids going to school? Uh, what is it that, uh, that's resulting from the help that we're providing? Who do you think is best equipped to, because it really is kind of a, a poverty mindset that becomes institutionalized. I yeah. worked with, with actually the, the welfare or social services department in LA and the Barrios right. uh, and Watts of LA for a couple years and, and the social workers were so discouraged because they were seeing generational um, work, you know, on, on welfare or what have you. And so yeah. a whole new concept was taken and what, what they found was that, you know, it's so very difficult to break that cycle and get people into a different mindset. So what's, yeah. is it, is it a, a large, program or yeah. program closer to in the community? How, how do you, what's, yeah. what have you seen? Yeah, I think a few principles that we practice that I think are pretty key. And, and one is the idea that uh, if you're going to have a sustainable approach to uh, creating healthy environments, healthy neighborhoods, healthy families, mm -hmm. that there's got to be ownership from the people that you are ultimately trying to help or serve. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have a program or an approach where all the help comes from the outside, all the volunteers, all the money, all of the expertise, all the resources come and are imported, uh, the minute somebody decides, hey, we don't really think this is important anymore, anything that was done is gone, right. okay? So in contrast, if you uh, begin by organizing residents, getting to know the residents. This is why the church is so vital, by the way, right. okay? Because if I could uh, talk about the one institution that are present in neighborhoods, mm -hmm. it, it's really the church. Now, there has been uh, the flight of, you know, uh, many Christian church uh, uh, churches that have left poor areas, for the suburbs, uh, yeah. right, for the suburbs mm -hmm. and all, but but usually there's still a church there. Now it's a new immigrant church or mm -hmm. somebody else yeah, that's, right. that's the there. Still there. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if that church begins to be mobilized mm -hmm. to care for the community, uh, one, one of the most powerful stories that I, I uh, have heard, and we tell this all over the country, is a group of young people in Chicago, uh, high school kids, unchurched, uh, they uh, started a Bible study, they started to get together, and then they started singing songs and doing all this with their coach, fo uh, football coach, and they finally asked him, well, well listen, uh, we don't seem to fit into the other churches in the neighborhood. Aren't we a church? I mean, aren't we doing what the Bible says a church does? Mm -hmm. And so in that process, uh, they began a church about 35 years ago. Very quickly, one of the questions they asked was, uh, we are called to love our neighbor. We're right. reading this. Sure. Does that also mean that we're supposed to love our neighborhood? Right. Okay. Well, you can go to seminary for four years and never 
talk Get about that. that. Right. Exactly. So that's pretty profound. And so I think if churches begin to love their neighborhood from within the neighborhood, okay, mm -hmm. it's not people from the outside, but you're the stakeholder, you're the neighbor, you're there, you look around and say, uh, hey, how can I love my neighbor as myself? Mm -hmm. Let's better the schools. Let's uh, address safety issues. Let's create jobs. Let's look at what's going on here and begin to address that. And if you have a stakehold in that process, then you can say, let's invite other people to join us. Mm -hmm. So there's a great church on the other side of the tracks. They don't, they're not here. They don't live here. They, but they've got doctors mm -hmm. and lawyers and they've got accountants and contractors and they want to serve somewhere. Why don't we partner with them and let's bridge that gap. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless yeah. of you know what culture or language right. we speak or whatever. But now what's different is that it's the people from the neighborhood that are driving the process. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, let's work together to address the issues. And it may not be, you know, let's paint that building for the 50th time, like youth groups come in to do often right. on a work trip, right. but let's, let's build a school or let's create a scholarship program for kids or, you know, I mean, Something. the solutions yeah, that right. they've come up with. So are you fundamentally against the sort of the short-term mission mentality? Well, I, I, I know I'm going to probably uh, make a few people mad here, but, uh, uh, you know, there is a book that just came out by one of our leaders, uh, one of our board members called Toxic Charity. And, and he kind of takes that on and, and he says, you know, when we create a system whereby you, you, you actually create dependency or you create this kind of um, uh, approach where, uh, you're, you're more concerned about helping the person on the outside than the, than the community itself, that that can really have grave consequences. So there, there, I think there's a, there's a sense where um, we can recreate and reframe uh, and, and th that experience and say, you know, we're going to go and help our young people um, learn about a different culture. We're going to go and, on an exposure trip. We're going to go on a on a, on a uh, you know an experience mm -hmm. to, yeah. to to really be stretched, instead of saying you know we're going to go do missions and go save the people over here, right. because I think the reality is, and I've heard this from many many folks, not only in the United States, it happens along the border, sure. but in, in other countries, mm -hmm. you know these kids have been saved uh, every week for the last uh, three four weeks in the summer because new groups come in. And they know if they'll raise their hand and say the prayer that they're going to get stuff. Right. I mean, that cannot be what the Bible means, you know, when it says love your neighbor. Right. right? Yeah. Or, or, you know, to, to, to the idea that people ought to really respond to Christ because of the great news that uh, is being presented. Right. I think, you know, we've got to be careful with how we do missions. I mean, I think much of the writing of Paul really, you mm -hmm. know, is talking about warnings about that. So, right. Well, what it, in that context of what you're just describing your, with your approach, what is the best, do you believe in evangelizing people? Absolutely, absolutely. You, you know, here's the approach that I believe God mm -hmm. took. The Word became flesh and lived among us, right? right. He comes, He lives into the, he, he enters our broken world and He loves people. And in the process of loving people, and sometimes it, uh, the Bible says that he heals disease. Sometimes he, uh, you know, uh, multiplies uh, uh, bread and, and fish so mm -hmm. that people can eat. Uh, and in the process of loving people, he also talks about the kingdom. And he talks about their need to, to, to have a new life. Uh, you know, he doesn't say the same thing to everybody. But to Nicodemus, he tells him, you know, you need to be born again. Mm -hmm. The others, he, he tells him, you know, uh, uh, follow me and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, seek uh, the, the kingdom, seek my life. And so obviously evangelism is an absolutely central part of what our mission is as, as Christian and as a church. What I would love to see is a recognition that an incarnational approach to evangelism is central and, and, and biblical and the best way to, to go about it, okay? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that when you live among the people and when you are, are uh, you know, when you are present among the people mm -hmm. and you live out your faith and you talk about your faith within the context of that mm -hmm. uh, community, mm -hmm. uh, powerful things happen. Right. And that 
even, you know, I mean, obviously, God can use a television show. Mm -hmm. God can use a radio program. Uh, you're, uh, you know, many times I'm on an airplane and I've talked to somebody that I don't know and we get into a spiritual conversation. Obviously, God uses that. But most uh, profoundly, it's the people that you live with on your street that see you every day. Right. You know, the parents that you uh, uh, go to the school with, with your kids. And, and, and so among the poor, and when you think about poor neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are vulnerable, you know, that's the best approach. So I, 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 I kind of talk about drive-by evangelism, mm -hmm. okay, and the damage that that can cause. Where we go in and do a little deal on a Saturday in a park, and we feel good because we have, you know, talked about right. God's love for us and for, for the people that we're there to serve. But oftentimes the church that, th that maybe is there is left out of the equation. And um, I don't know if it's really as effective because one of the things that you find also is that evangelism is always talked about in Scripture alongside discipleship, right? right. So discipleship happens within the context of incarnation. We're living there, we're, we're living out our faith, talking about Jesus and, and salvation, and then helping people to grow within the context of that community. And that you, one of the things that you, you also talk about, I yeah. think, is the whole issue of social transformation. Yeah. And what do you mean by that? Yeah. Is that a, a code word for something? Or, well, yeah. actually, uh, I, I think it really is as simple as what I just said these kids talked about in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. If you love your neighbor, if you're called to love your neighbor, are we really called to love your neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you if you are going to, uh, I mean, I mean, here's here's a couple of views of how, what what God's up to and how He right. works in our in our world. Okay, um, we know that um, uh, He's coming back to create a new heaven and a new earth. We know that he's going to come back and, and, and you might have a different view of the end times right. or eschatology yeah, or whatever. Yeah, we won't go there. <laughs> hey, yeah. But, but you, we know that God says, while you're here, love God, love people, be holy, live for him, for his kingdom. But he's going to come back and create something totally different, right? Mm -hmm. So does that mean that while we're here, we just leave things the way they are? And in fact, the worse they get, the better it is for us because it means God is coming back. Right. Well, I believe that, that we're to engage in the world because we don't know the hour or the time when he's coming back. And we're to love our people. And, and if we really love people the way we want to be loved, then we're not just going to go into a neighborhood that's got violence and gangs and drugs and no health care and terrible schools and say, Jesus loves you, and one day you're going to get to go to heaven. We're going to go in and say, Jesus loves you, and one day you're going to get to heaven. But now that we're part of his kingdom, let's work to transform the neighborhood. Let's love our neighbors by helping them experience the goodness of God on this planet while we're here. And let's engage in helping to just make the environment in which we live uh, the kind of place that uh, I believe would be uh, glorifying mm -hmm. to God. Now, what, you know, the last historical book in the Bible is the book of Nehemiah. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you, uh, you know, Testament. in the Old Testament, yeah. right. right? So most people that, that uh, have ever heard a teaching or a preaching on the book of Nehemiah, it's been a sermon about leadership, mm -hmm. okay, because Nehemiah was a great leader mm -hmm. or a building program for your church, right? right? Yeah. Hey, and, and, and uh, you know, how many days, 51 days, they rebuilt the walls, we can build the church, you know. And, and 52. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, if you give, right? Yeah, right? Which, that's fantastic. But you know what that book is about? It's a historical account of a, of a city that's not working, right? In yeah. Jerusalem. Right. And it's how it in ruins, yeah. Yeah, it's in ruins. It'd been abandoned. Uh, there was spiritual leadership there. Ezra, the priest, was there. Others were there. But the city did not do well. It wasn't until this uh, other leader, Nehemiah, comes, who is a government official. He takes a leave of absence from his post in the Persian government. He comes. He, it says that he's the governor of this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, town, right. city. And then what does he do? He rebuilds the walls. He creates a safe environment. He pulls uh, Ezra the priest, and together they say, let's follow God together. Let's, we need revival, not just spiritual but they, they, they went about the work of re-establishing the well-being of that neighborhood, mm -hmm. okay? I think that's a model 
for broken cities today. Right. Uh, because I think, I mean, here, here's what we find. We are pumping billions and billions of dollars into inner cities all over this country. Our government is doing it. The private sector through nonprofits are doing it. Churches are doing it. And the question we've got to ask mm -hmm. at some point, is it making any difference? Right. And I believe the way we're gonna make a difference is by having uh, Christians from within the community begin to work on not just symptoms, but on the core issues that affect people's lives. And one of those is that spiritual, uh, you know, regeneration that every mm -hmm. human being needs mm -hmm. so that they can be everything God created them to be. Right. Well, I, I think that the book of Nehemiah is a fascinating model and, and how it, he really was a government official empowered by, yeah. by, uh, um, the king uh, yeah. at uh, Babylon at that time. Yes. And the, the thing that, that concerns me right now is, is that, uh, that government and social yeah. agencies are not working together anymore. And you, <clears throat> case in point, the Catholic Church, who you know, had uh, you know, adoption agencies, hospitals, and that kind yeah. of thing, but because they wouldn't go along with abortion, for example, sure. right. uh, they're, they're literally put out of business. They're no longer able to function. So what I'm seeing yeah. is, is that instead that, that it's becoming increasingly difficult for the government social programs yeah. to, and, and religious organizations to work together simply because the government is requiring, you know, you can't speak about your faith. Uh, you have to believe this. You must yeah. include uh, certain kinds of individuals, you can't discriminate, and all, right. all of these things, which right. <coughs> generally are true, but yeah. specifically violates conscience. So, so what do yeah. you think about that that issue? Yeah, no, that's a very good question, and I and I deal with this all the time because I, uh, you know, uh, of the thousand organizations that we work with around the country, mm -hmm. uh, some of them choose uh, very much on principle. We're not going to get any government funding of right. any sort. And others, uh, they say the need in the neighborhood uh, for, let's say, health care, okay, right. or education is so great that we're going we're gonna to take government funding to do some type of service, and we will act like the Catholic Charities, you know, or the, the Lutherans or, uh, uh, you know, Salvation Army or, uh, or other entities that for years have, have been getting uh, support to do the very, very important work of providing a social uh, safety net for the right. uh, poorest of the poor. Now, you know, uh, I, I would say that um, for all these years, we've maneuvered that separation of church and state. And uh, I think, uh, but, but again, I want to really be clear that there's been a long, long kind of history of, of ministries and churches that have said, we don't want to partake in that way. Right. And I think, you know, uh, if God leads them to do that, I think that's the way they ought to go. Now, those that are engaged, uh, mm -hmm. they've had to kind of uh, realize, uh, you know, we're working with this secular, uh, you know, entity. And um, what we're finding is that today there is concern uh, that over this, you know, next two, three years, there's going to be a lot of of debate, a lot of uh, work on civil liberties, the role of the church, the ability of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, religious groups to get government support mm -hmm. to do the work that we do. Now, under government, uh, uh, President Bush, uh, you know, obviously he he was a proponent, uh, and I, you know, one of the famous things he said was, when there is a, a drug rehab program. Uh, that works and and what makes it work is Jesus let him do it right? Right, right and and I would say that there's still that opportunity uh, you know mm -hmm. within our relationship with many parts of government we run a one of our organizations uh, runs a health center on the west side of Chicago our, our mission statement is to provide quality affordable health care in an atmosphere of Christian love they get uh, government funding even though that's their mission Doctors, uh, you know, um, uh, they, they uh, uh, make a decision that they're not going to participate in abortions or counsel in that way. So, uh, you know, th there is uh, a lot of example of, mm -hmm. of, of, of folks that are uh, giving out food, but they're not proselytizing while they're doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the decision that a church has to make. If you say we're going to provide a uh, tutoring program 
but everything we do, it's going to be about the Bible and Jesus. You're probably not going to be a good candidate to, to go after government funding mm -hmm. uh, to do this program. But you might say, listen, uh, we want to teach kids character. We want to teach kids, uh, you know, how to be good citizens. We want to give them food. We want to provide a safe place after school. For that part, we'll do, uh, uh, we'll take government money and then we'll invite kids to say voluntarily, okay, if you want to come uh, after our program, we're going to run, a, we have a little uh, club that we're doing and uh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a it's overtly Christian. Mm -hmm. It's a, the the mission of helping kids come to Christ or whatever, but it, there is a, a level of complexity to the the work that uh, uh, churches engage in mm -hmm. when they're working with the government. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think it's uh, we're, we're going to have to wait and see uh, how uh, aggressive. Okay, this kind of attack on church will be My, but there's a lot of people working on this praying about this mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I do now you're, you're on President Obama's council for faith in neighborhoods is that right I, I was uh, I, I served on uh, mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, term uh, there's now a second uh, council mm -hmm. but uh, faith and neighborhood partnerships uh, a 25 member council that was very broad not all Christian evangelical sure. Catholic and Right. Uh, others, uh, but um, you know, so that was one of the kind of uh, forums where we had to work really hard to say, do not take away the powerful distinctive that we bring as Christian right. organizations. Yeah. And where they was was the is is the bureaucracy the open to that, or is it it. Uh I guess it depends on the individuals. Yeah, no, things. I mean, I do think that, that right now we have protections in the law uh, to do that. But like in every uh, big program, whether it's government or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to always monitor and you mm -hmm. always have to be aware. And what, uh, what happens in El Paso and what happens in California and Chicago, there's somebody who's who's saying, hey, we don't want any church, uh, you know, we're not going to give money to any church programs. And, right. and they could be that rogue uh, individual that has some, you know, pet peeve or is very, yeah. you know, and they opposed. Can, they, and they can make it happen. Exactly. Or not happen. Yeah. But I think that there are ways to attack that and there are ways to bring about, uh, to, you know, to, to really uh, to confront that. Uh, well, we're going to have to have you back next time to talk about it <laughs> well, <laughs> because our time is up. <laughs> wow, I feel like we just got started. Yeah, right, yeah. 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 Well, uh, it has been a pleasure to talk with you, and I appreciate um, uh, the vision that you have for yeah. reaching out and, yeah. and, and getting others excited about that vision also. Yeah, I guess in closing, I would just say my heart and uh, many of the members of our association is to really bring about a kingdom-focused transformation of the poorest cities of our nation yeah. and to do it in a way that would really honor God. Yeah, right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. And we, we'll talk again. Okay. Thank thanks. you. Do you think that some of us are guilty of hurting more than helping? Uh, what do you think of what uh, Noel Castellano has said about the way we do ministry? Please let us know uh, by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or our website. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.